Well, I've been a, a mountaineer and, and a climber since I was 15 years old. And people sometimes ask me, what's your favorite climb? And that's hard to answer because there's a lot of favorite climbs. But one of the ones that I remember best, that I loved the most, was a route on Mount Kenya in East Africa, the second highest mountain in Kenya. Uh, it was a magical climb, right on the equator, a ribbon of ice that required ice axes and crampons, and it was difficult. Um, it was very steep, and there was one place, in fact, where you had to go behind a hanging curtain of ice and actually go inside an ice cave and climb up and chop your way out of the top of it and exit onto the summit. It was like magical. But magical as it was, it's in the past tense because now with climate change, the ice is all melted and the ice window is gone. Like it's just not there anymore. It fell off. All the ice just fell off the mountain. So <clears throat> that's like a dagger in your heart when that's one of your favorite climbs in the world and it's not there anymore because of climate change. How did we end up with fast fashion? Where did this come from? Perhaps uh, the answer is in uh, the ability of companies to deliver uh, fashion faster and faster. You know, with the ability to deliver inexpensive clothes because they're made uh, in places where the costs are the lowest and they can be turned around uh, with the, the fastest speed possible and um, change uh, weekly or monthly. Maybe that's uh, just from having that capability, you end up with fast fashion because you know, that satisfies a, a desire and a need in people. If that's the case, then it's that, that desire with, from the consumer that's driving it. And that's where the change has to come from. Since 2005, Rick has been responsible for environmental initiatives at Patagonia. The Outer Clothing Company, founded by a fellow rock climber 40 years earlier, took an environmental approach from the outset. Among other things, they commit 1% of their annual sales to environmental groups and have founded programs to help and encourage consumers to recycle their clothes. In 2011, Rick and his team launched an advertising campaign with a consumption message that goes against everything you learn at business school. So what about this, folks? In the most potent environmental appeal of the season, Patagonia just placed a full-page ad in the New York Times on the holiest of sales days, Black Friday. Don't buy this jacket, says the headline. Along with the retailer's R2 coat, the ad asks people to think twice before buying Patagonia products. Since our clothing consumption, as stated in the copy, puts the economy of natural systems that support all life firmly in the red. Well, how's that for a Black Friday ad? The campaign to try to convince our customers to buy uh, just what they need came out of the recession that began in, in 2009, when we started to realize that people were responding to the recession by redefining their relationship to stuff including clothing. And there were a number of people that were recognizing that you actually save money if you buy things that last longer and you buy fewer of them as a consequence. And we wanted to figure out, well, how can we uh, provide a service to those people? I was able to convince uh, Yvonne Chouinard, who owns the company, uh, that he wanted to do this. But then it took both of us to convince others inside the company uh, quite a while, uh, especially the people in sales and, and merchandising. You can imagine you go to them and say, well, we want to run this ad to uh, ask people not to buy our stuff unless they really need it. And they go, you want to do what? <laughs> they think you're crazy. But then you have to explain the reason for it. And you have to bring it into the context of the company's responsibility to the environment. 
it's not don't buy the jacket, but it's don't buy the jacket if you don't need it. And that's what the real message is. That's what we're asking people to think about, you know, of buying just what you need, of taking care of it, fixing it, reselling it if you're not using it, recycling it was completely worn out. And the fact is that our, our sales went up after that ad and they've continued to go up and the companies continued to uh, grow. But we hope it's growing because more people are buying our products because they last a long time and that they're listening to what we have to say about consumption and deciding in their own lives to not buy as much stuff if they don't really need it. I'm a little suspect about uh, making any product that is climate positive, but it's possible to make it approaching climate neutral. Uh, but even there, that's a, a very, very difficult uh, chore, not only with consumer goods, but even with food. You know, take food as an example. Farmers have been trying to uh, develop farming techniques that use no more energy than the sun can put back on the land, and they can't do it. Manufactured goods are even more of an impact than, than farming uh, with those kinds of um, technologies. To make the clothing industry anywhere near sustainable, the responsibility is not only with manufacturers, retailers, and brands. The responsibility is also with us, the consumers. Because as Rick pointed out earlier, while we need to buy less, we also need to care more for the clothing we already own. Take this jacket that I'm wearing, for example. Half of the impact of this jacket on the planet over its lifetime was with Patagonia that made the jacket. The other half of its impact is with me, the person that bought it, and how I use and care for it. In past generations, people would take care of their own products, their own clothes. They would fix them. They would f sew patches on them. They would repair them if they're broken to get the most out of them. And in fact, Patagonia, back in its very early days, made repair kits. Uh, and now we're making repair kits again for our customers. And not only are we having offering repair kits, but we also have made repair videos in partnership with a small company called iFixit that teach people how to fix their clothes uh, if they're broken. iFixit is the free repair manual for everything. Our goal is to teach everyone how to fix all their stuff. So we have free repair manuals for everything from cell phones to cars to clothing. And we do everything we can to teach people how to make this stuff last longer. I think it's fundamental to learn how to work on the things that we consume. Rather than being a passive consumer society, wouldn't it be great if we could all be more actively involved in our things? And one of the fantastic things about repairing things is that you start to get more connected to your products. And, and maybe I, I, I fix a jacket and I put different different zipper on it than came with it, or I, I change some of the colors. And now, rather than that being something that I bought, it's something that I own. Thinking about it or talking about an environmental problem, I think once you actually do something, once you actually sew something, once you actually fix something, it becomes a real tangible experience. And I think that that changes the way that you feel about it and the way that you interact with it. And suddenly this becomes a part of your skills and your learning and your persona that's not, that wouldn't be if you were to just buy a new jacket. There used to be fashion houses where every garment was handmade, one of a kind, and then we hit this industrial age in the 20s and 30s where suddenly garments were being mass produced. And I think once people get back to feeling the value of having this jacket be my unique jacket and having that be sort of the couture, I think we'll be in a much better place.
You know, with the clothing that we have, it's, it's I mean, intimately connected to us. It, our clothing suffers more wear and tear than anything else that we have. And it seems preposterous if we want to move to a more sustainable society that we don't start with the things that we're most closely familiar with. So we started getting going, teaching people how to fix clothes. Uh, we started with basic things like how to put a button back on and then some more complicated repairs like working on zippers. We empower millions of people every month to learn how to repair things. It's been exciting to see people stretch themselves and learn how to repair things they never would have been able to repair before. We see moms fixing iPods for their kids and now we see kids fixing jackets for their moms. And it's really exciting to see us connecting families and connecting people together through things that used to separate them.